Our gospel reading comes from Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 23. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. They were traveling at night on the Rio Patuca, a wide river running through the rainforest on the northeastern coast of Honduras. A nearly full moon was all the light they had to guide them, except for a flashlight held by one man, who stood at the bow of the longboat, shining the beam here and there to point out floating debris and other hazards. But by carrying passengers at night, the boat's owner could earn their fare and be ready the next day to ferry lobster divers down the river to the sea. And so they traveled in the dark, a party of 13, hoping to arrive by about 2 a.m. in the village of Awas. But sometime during the night of May 10th, 2012, the people on the boat were startled by the noise of helicopters and a plane circling above the river. Frightened, the boat owner swerved his vessel from side to side. Passengers shouted at the man in the bow to turn off his flashlight. Then the shooting began. Guns from the helicopters fired over and over. Some of the boat's passengers made it into the water and then to the shore. Some did not. Four people, including a 14-year-old boy, died under fire from the Honduran military and United States Drug Enforcement agents, who had mistaken the people on the longboat for the drug runners they had expected to encounter along the river that night. The people on the boat had cried out in the darkness, shouting to the forces to hold their fire. Nobody listened to the people in the darkness. Our gospel text today mentions people in darkness. Well, we call it our gospel text, but it is borrowed in part from the Old Testament. Matthew does this kind of free borrowing throughout his gospel. He uses the Hebrew scriptures to demonstrate that Christ fulfills the Jewish hope for a Messiah, and thus the world's hope for salvation. And in today's text, Matthew links Jesus to Isaiah's declaration that people in darkness have seen a great light. For Matthew and for millions of gospel readers over centuries, and for us today, that light is Jesus Christ. Now we can follow this text through history. The gospel writer reads the scripture of the Jews and finds Jesus in it. Subsequent generations accept that Christ is the light for the people in darkness, and then they find for themselves a role in bringing that light to others. And around 1492, European Christians discovered that there were a lot of others they had not suspected in the world. And the age of exploration touched off an age of missions. That's how our Moravian ancestors, among others, 
eventually got to America. And it didn't take long for Christianity to become so established in America that churches here sent missionaries to still other populations, all in the name of bringing light. Bringing the knowledge of Christ to light the lives of others is wonderful work. But problems arose if missionaries became confused about the kind of light they were bringing and where to shine it. Sometimes they thought that the people in darkness needed not only the light of Christ, but all the benefits of white Western civilization. Missionary work sometimes suffered from a connection with British or American imperialism. In other words, problems arose when missionaries went abroad thinking they were the only ones with a story to tell. Now things are different today, thanks be to God. We had proof of that just last Sunday right here in our own pulpit when Donna Hurt and Patty Garner described their experiences in mission to Moravians in Albania and Africa. It was clear that they went to these places prepared to listen at least as much as they talked and to learn at least as much as they taught. And what they brought back was not the story they had told, but the stories they had received. And in doing so, they shed light on our ignorance about life in Albania and Sierra Leone, and we are grateful. Now here's the thing about light. It works best when it shines on the places that really need illumination. I'll give you an example. I've got this huge window in my office, which I love. It sheds so much light that I don't even need to turn on the overhead for most of the day. But at certain times of day, right now it's first thing in the morning, the light from that window shines not on my work but directly into my eyes. If you walk by my office and see a clothespin holding the drapes together, that would be why. Unwelcome and unhelpful is the light that blinds the viewer instead of illuminating darkness. So before we go bearing light, we must first determine what needs to be illuminated. And to do that, we have to really listen to the people in darkness. The troubled history of the missionary movement is what gives that phrase, the people sitting in darkness, an unhappy resonance. Mark Twain, one of my favorite authors, used the phrase to mock American imperialism. So I confess that I used to be a little uncomfortable with the phrase. But as I was reading the Matthew text a few weeks ago, a footnote in my Bible caught my eye. Now, here's what it said. Verse 16, the people who sat in darkness, those who suffered most from the Assyrian invasions. Now this was a new reading for me, so I went back and read Isaiah 9, which Donna read this morning. That's the source of Matthew's allusion. Read the phrase in context. And you see that Isaiah's people in darkness have been suffering something very different from simple ignorance. They have been oppressed, beaten up, and bowed down. They have suffered violence from invading armies. That's why Isaiah rejoices in their coming deliverance by the hand of God. That's why Isaiah cries, the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. That's why Isaiah exults in the promise that all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. Isaiah promises light to people walking in the darkness of oppression, invasion, and military violence. The name of that light is the Prince of Peace. In the 1930s, Moravian missionaries brought light to Honduras with the knowledge of Christ. But today, the people of Honduras live in the kind of darkness of which Isaiah writes, the kind with the boots of the tramping warriors and the garments rolled in blood. How can we help our brothers and sisters in Honduras? Where do we shine a light? The only way to know is to listen to the people in darkness. 
What if someone in a helicopter above the Rio Patuca had listened to the people in the darkness, the people on the boat crying out for the gunmen to stop shooting, crying out that they were not drug runners, they were not criminals, they were just citizens making their way to their homes up the river? Or better yet, what if someone had listened before that night? Did people in positions of power in Honduras or in America really listen to the stories of ordinary citizens of Honduras? If so, they would have heard that some Honduran police had hired themselves out to death squads, or that people who suffered at the hands of either drug traffickers or corrupt police had no recourse with the state. They might have considered whether the light from helicopters like the one that flew that night over the river might be the wrong kind of light, shining in the wrong place, bringing no light of hope or peace to the people in the darkness of violence in a country with the highest murder rate in the world. Or consider this. What if before that night someone had really listened to the stories of a large group of people sitting in darkness in America. Was anyone available to listen to Americans caught in the spiritual darkness of drug use? Because drug users in America, people with addictions or with a taste for drugs as recreation, are fueling the drug trade that has brought such violence to Honduras. Listening to their stories might tell us where to shed a light in their lives, to light up their darkness. Shedding a light that brings a drug user out of darkness can lighten the darkness that has descended on people far away. The choices made by one person in darkness can spread violence, oppression, injustice, and pain to others. Darkness begets darkness. The spiritual darkness of a drug user in America thrusts Honduras into the darkness of violence and fear. There are many other examples. The spiritual darkness of a Bernard Madoff on Wall Street thrusts the folks on Main Street who trusted him with their wages into the darkness of poverty. The spiritual darkness of recreational consumerism in America thrust the people of developing countries into the darkness of factory work at slave wages. Darkness begets darkness. The cure for darkness is to shine a light. Light is most helpful when it shines in the right places. And we won't know the right places unless we listen to the people in darkness. What will we hear? Sometimes we will hear stories of spiritual darkness, the darkness that causes a person to seek out drugs or cheat others for financial gain or spend himself into poverty trying to fill holes in his life with material goods. For others, the darkness may be the darkness of violence and oppression and injustice. And if we listen long enough and carefully enough, we may hear how the stories connect and understand how our own choices can influence cultures far away. Listening to people in darkness can be challenging. Some stories are very hard to listen to. But unless we are willing to go into the darkness, to sit with people in darkness, to be open to what we might hear there, it will be hard to shine the light of Christ where it is most needed. In Matthew's Gospel, what happens right before today's text is Jesus' time in the wilderness. Just before Jesus began his ministry, he willingly entered the darkness, and he did not shy away from anything he encountered there. He listened attentively even to the blandishments of Satan himself. Imagine the insight this gave him into spiritual darkness, the things that tempt human beings, our unholy notions about how to fill the holes in our lives. 
Ever afterward, wherever he went, Jesus opened himself to the stories of people who were living in darkness and shone light into their darkest places. I think of that one man in the bow of the boat on the Rio Patuca, shining his flashlight on the water at night. I imagine him training that beam, now here, now there, shining where it would be most helpful, picking out the dangers in the darkness, guiding the boat's captain forward. His name was Emerson Martinez, and he died that night on the river. His last act in this world was to shine a light in the darkness. May our faith make us so steadfast in our task. May our listening make us so helpful in aiming our light. And may the hand of God guide us all out of darkness, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>